Good morning or good afternoon to you, depending on which part in the world you're attending from. And welcome to this online Pachakacha style presentation on the manufacturing possibilities of copper through 3D printing and powder injection molding. Pachakacha is a different way of presenting, only showing pictures accompanied by a brief explanation to keep it short and to the point. This is the team of presenters today. The first picture on the left is Laurent Mark. He is responsible for all 3D printer seals in Europe for Apatec. In the middle is Harry Snijers, sales manager at Formatec, a production company for ceramic injection molding, metal injection molding, and 3D printing of metal and ceramic parts. On the right side, you see me, Laura Norlander, the marketing lead for both Apatec and Formatec. Before starting the presentation of Laurent and Harry, I have some general remarks to share. Everyone is muted by default. If you have a question, feel free to ask this via the Q&A function of this meeting. Do note, we will address any questions only at the end of the presentation. To finalize, I want to notify you that this presentation will be recorded for later reference. This enables us to share it with you afterwards, but also to share it with people that were not able to join us live. I would like to thank you for attending it live. Now I will hand over to Laurent Mack, who will explain to you what the opportunities are to manufacturing copper through 3D printing. Thank you, Laura, for your uh, kind introduction and uh, welcome at our presentation about uh, 3D printing of copper. Uh, my name is uh, Laurent Mack and I'm working at uh, Alphatec Europe. Uh, on the picture, you see a part of our team in the Netherlands. Uh, we like to do team building exercise at the beach, but of course, most of the work is done in the 3D printing lab. Alphatec started in 2012 as a project to investigate the possibilities of 3D printing of ceramics. We have developed our own printing technology, which we call Atmaflex. In 2013, we started a job shop for 3D printing of ceramic parts. Since 2016, we are offering printing machines and we can print metals as well. Copper has many interesting properties, such as high electrical and thermal conductivity. Recently, because of the COVID pandemic, we have seen much interest in copper because of its antiviral properties. On polymer and stainless steel, Viruses can stay dangerous for several days. On copper, viruses will be harmless within a few hours. There are many ways to shape copper, and one of them is using 3D printing. 3D printing is becoming more and more important for fast and local production of essential parts. Especially in a crisis situation, it is important that you can act quickly and locally. If we take full advantage of the design freedom that 3D printing is offering, in many cases, we can, produ can produce with less material and with less individual parts, resulting in better, lighter, more efficient and more cost-effective products. In our process, we start with ceramic or metal powders with a fine grain size. We mix the powders with a liquid, UV-sensitive resin, and this feedstock is called slurry. When UV light is applied, the slurry cures to a stiff polymer and this holds together the ceramic or metal powders. With help of a 3D printer, we can build virtually any shape by adding layer after layer. In our printing machine, we use a tape casting process to transport a thin layer of slurry to the printing area. It is important to keep the metal particles in motion to avoid sedimentation. Therefore, we use an automatic slurry mixing and dosing system. The benefit of using slurry is that we have no loose powder, so no dust. This means working with our printer is safe and easy. The part is pressed into the slurry and the UV light from the bottom will selectively cure the material and add this as a next layer to the product. The printing material, which is not used in the layer, is collected and pumped back. The benefit of this process is that we have no waste of printing material. This picture shows the parts when printing is finished. You can see there is still some uncured slurry on the part. The part will be cleaned with water and a mild solvent and then undergo debinding and sintering. Here we see the part of pure copper after sintering. 
To avoid oxidation, sintering of copper must be done in a protective atmosphere. The result is a full dense part with a very smooth surface. This spiral of pure copper we have printed for measuring the electrical conductivity. Depending on the sintering conditions, the electrical resistance is comparable to conventionally shaped copper. Next to pure copper, we can also shape copper alloys, silver or precious metals. The printing machine has open software, which means we can adjust all settings for different materials. We can also print touch buttons and technical parts with fine features. The parts from this photo are about 30 mm in diameter. The wall thickness is between 2 and 4 mm, which is well printable. On the front, we see a hole for M5 thread. On the top, we see several small holes of only 400 micron. The picture on the left shows the heating stage for research applications. In the center of the stage, there is a micro furnace, which heats up very fast to 1000 degrees C. The electrical insulating part was 3D printed in aluminum oxide. The copper part is for the electrical connection to the micro furnace. For research and development, we can also make prints with multi-materials, such as combinations of alumina and copper in just one single print. It is important to understand that the material should have compatible sintering conditions. In this case, you would need a low purity alumina to match the sintering temperature of copper. For medical applications and 5G antenna technology, thin walls can be very important. Recently, we have printed a ceramic honeycomb structure with walls of only 100 micron. Using the same 3D print technology, we've also printed the fine grit in copper. Here, the small pins on the left and right are freestanding walls of only 100 micron. On this photo, you see a 3D printed part where we zoomed in very much. Here, the part is just printed, but not yet sintered. You can even see the layers or pixel resolution of the UV projection system. Typically, we use square pixels between 50 and 30 micron and layers between 30 and 10 micron. After sintering, these layers are not visible anymore. The product is then very smooth. These pictures show scanning electron microscope images of sintered metals, which are printed on the Optiflex printer. You can see the retaining of sharp edges on the left and the regular microstructure on the right. One of the benefits of the sintering process is that the product is completely stress-free. Another benefit is the very good surface quality. In most cases, post-processing such as sandblasting or polishing is not needed. Here you see the printing machine, which Atmatech provides for the parts we have shown in this short presentation. Our sister company, Formatech, is using several of these printers for offering parts for customers all over the world. I would like to thank you for your attention. I would look forward to your questions. But first, we switch back to Laura and my colleague Hardy, who will tell you more about injection molding. Thank you, Laura. Now we will turn to Harry Snijers. He will explain more about the possibilities of producing copper through the powder injection molding process. Thank you, Laura. Welcome. Uh, I will take you on a little journey through the world of powder injection molding. We are Formatech, a Dutch company in the Brainport area. Formatech is specialized in the production of metal and ceramic parts on customer's demand. For this, we make use of the injection molding and additive manufacturing process or also known as 3D printing. I would like to tell you more about these techniques. Also, copper is one of these materials that is suited for molding and 3D printing. It's coming extra into the spotlight due to its uh, antiviral property. We discover every day more applications thanks to our customers. It's important to know the processes because they determine if the product, or better said, the geometry, is feasible for molding or printing. We see it as a team effort. Therefore, we would like to participate in the project at the earliest time possible, advise the customer what is the best route, and so ensure the success of the project. As we see it, your success is our success. First, an evaluation takes place, or the geometry. Sometimes there are changes needed to make it 
possible to even shape the part with molding or printing, but also for the functionality of the geometry in combination with the specific material that will be chosen. For this, we have some basic design rules that illustrate the optimal geometry. The first is avoid sharp inner corners because they could set off cracks during sintering. Secondly, avoid high wall thickness, which make the debinding of the part more difficult and could lead to voids in these areas due to the big temperature differences while cooling down after molding. And as last, try to have equal wall thickness. Otherwise, this could increase the chance of distortion of the part due to tension differences during sintering, or better said, during the shrinkage. For advice on material, we need to know what are the operating temperatures. How does the environment look like? Is it moist or are chemicals involved? What are the expected forces on the product? Quantity, finish, tolerances, and probably some additional product specific info. Based on this info, we give advice on the best material for the part. For injection molding of the parts, we need a dedicated mold, which you can compare with the ones of molding plastics. A feedstock, this is a polymer, or as we call it binder, highly filled with ceramic or metal powder and is injected in the mold. Out of this mold, a shape product comes and is ready for further processing. In this state, the material can be machined relatively easy because it hasn't reached its final hardness. So imagine that we can remove the injection point or add some additional features that are not possible with, shape, with the shaping processes. Now we're ready to remove the binder because it served its purpose. The next step is very important and needs experience and know-how. I'm speaking of the sintering process, the heat treatment that brings the material to its final dimension, density and strength. The reason the injection molding of these material exists is that it offers the benefit of high ge geometrical complexity that is reproducible and very cost effective. Although these days producing with 5x milling machine covers already a big chunk of the geometrical demands, it still has a significant disadvantage on price. Printing is also a competitor of molding on small series, but can't keep up with the price level on bigger quantities. We use the printing as the low invest startup complementary to the molding. Most common ceramics and metals are available as a feedstock. This covers a great deal of the demand, but for applications that need special properties, they can be customized. The standard materials for ceramics are uh, aluminum oxide in two, three purity grades and zirconium oxide. Until now, specials in ceramics were developed as there are ATZ, aluminum toughened zirconia, or ZTA, zirconia toughened alumina. For metal, you can think of a range of steel, copper, of course, and even refractory materials as molybdenum and tungsten. I will give some examples which have been successfully implemented. There was a need for a wear resistant material that also has electric static discharging properties for mounting components on PCBs with a pick and place nozzle, which you can see in the picture. Unfortunately for this application, the standard material uh, provides the only the wear resistance, but not electric conductivity. A zirconia based material was created that has a resistivity between 10 and 100 mega ohm. Now, both demands are served by a wear resistant ESD qualified ceramic. At this moment, a development is on the way for a medical application where the customer provides its own development bio ceramic powder. To have a feedstock made by us that can be used for molding his products. Of course, uh, this is uh, exclusively for this particular customer and for now not free available. These kind of developments 
are already available or in progress for metal feedstocks. A question came for a metal housing with high temperature conductivity, which led to copper. However, the housing had some very thin walls and became too vulnerable due to the ductile property of copper. A special additive was mixed in the feedstock to increase the stiffness. Now the housing is strong enough, kept its conductivity properties and made the application feasible. The SIM and MIM process is mostly about 60% similar for all products. For the remaining 40%, development is done to customize the process for your components. We from the MIM and SIM community are ready to reach out and help you to realize the components to, for your needs. We are now at the end of this small introduction into the world of powder injection molding. And I can imagine that questions came up. You, you can send me the questions via the contact details Laura will show. So back to Laura now. Well, thank and thank you to all the attendees for your attention. We have now come to the end of this presentation, but as said, before you leave, there is room to address the questions that were asked in the Q&A section. Also, please, please feel free to note down uh, our contact details that are now in the screen for later reference. I will jump quickly back to the Q&A session. Uh, well, the question that first came in, what is the grain size of the copper slurry? Uh, Lauren, can you please comment on that? Yeah, of course, I can give some uh, comments on that. So uh, the grain size of the, the particles which can be used uh, during the 3D printing uh, is uh, first dependent on the layer thickness we want to apply. So that means if we are using layers of uh, 30 micron, uh, then the copper grains uh, should not be bigger than uh, 30 micron. So that's uh, the limit on the, 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 the upper uh, part of the grain size. Uh, looking at the smallest uh, grain size, uh, if the grains would be uh, very small, which is uh, submicron, then you have the risk of uh, not having enough uh, depth of uh, uh, UV curing. So that means UV cannot travel enough through the slurry and that means you do not have enough depth of cure. So within, let's say, the, the 1 and the, the 20 or 30 micron, you have to find the optimum uh, particle size uh, to be able to, to print and uh, sinter uh, copper uh, perfectly. Uh, in the uh, slurry which is provided by Atmatec, we have found an uh, optimum uh, grain size uh, and people who have our machine can also buy our slurry materials. Uh, also, the machine is open, so it's also possible to buy just uh, a resin uh, premix and people can mix their own uh, SIM or MIM uh, powder to do their own uh, printing experiments. Okay, thank you, uh, Laurent. There is a question in Dutch, which I will uh, translate. Um, what is uh, the layer thickness of building a, pro a product? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, selectable and it's also related first on the possible uh, depth of cure you can obtain. So how far can the light uh, penetrate into the material? Uh, second, it is depending on the accuracy you want to, to have in your print. And uh, typically we use layer thickness between 10 micron and uh, 30 micron when printing in copper. Okay, uh, thank you again. Um, well, um, another question which I think I will have to shoot to Lauren is uh, how big is the copper filler content in the copper slurry? OK, so the machine has been designed to handle uh, high viscosity slurry materials, and that means we try to put as much as possible uh, solid uh, in the slurry material. Uh, typically, uh, we have more than 80 mass percent of uh, metal in the slurry materials, and that's uh, working quite well on the Alpaflex uh, machine. Yeah, yeah. There now uh, just a question came in. How is the viscosity? But I think that uh, that partially already uh, has been answered. Um, um, so let's skip to the next one. Um, what are the tolerances for 3D printing of copper? In a static sense, I guess, because the size must change during the sintering process. 
Yeah, so we know how much the the material will shrink during the sintering. So that means we can uh, print the sinter quite uh, accurately. Uh, I believe we have an overview with what we normally obtain with uh, 3D printing and injection molding. Maybe Laura, you can you can find that slide and show that on the screen. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will try to pull it up. Uh, one second. Uh, I think you mean. Uh, so it's so it's depending on the on the one? on the geometry. So this is an overview of the the uh, production techniques we uh, can offer. Uh, this is uh, uh, mainly on ceramic, but uh, in copper we see that we can obtain uh, comparable tolerances. So we see that for most uh, products we uh, can achieve a 0.5% accuracy when doing 3D printing. Uh, if, for example, one uh, edge uh, needs to be uh, within uh, one hundredth of a millimeter, we can do 3D printing followed by uh, machining. OK, um, thank you. Um, there is another question coming in. Um, how is the solid load of slurry weight and volume percent? Well, I mentioned already uh, an indication of the mass percentage. Uh, the exit composition is part of our IP, uh, which we, we cannot share uh, uh, just now. Yeah, OK. Um, then um, uh, I see you're looking at antimicrobial copper. How do you think to handle the biocide regulation issue? Well, that is a very um, particular uh, question. Um, and I think that in general, what uh, Laurent already uh, said, um, there are some uh, details that we uh, not openly share. And um, biocide regulations, well, uh, in general, we are a manufacturing company. We manufacture 3D printing, uh, 3D printers. Uh, Formatech manufactures uh, products, so they have production of metal and ceramic products. So we uh, are not, entirely involved in regulation um, um, regulation affairs and um, also all kinds of uh, grades. So that is something that we would have to uh, add another partner which has knowledge of that. I think that is uh, mainly the answer, uh, Lauren and Harry, right? Mm -hmm. And of yes. course, together with the customer, we can we can look which regulations uh, are uh, applicable and see if our materials are uh, uh, yeah, are also uh, uh, fine for that application. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, let me see if there's any other um, um, another question. What is the density you have already achieved? Um, there is no particular material mentioned. Um, so typical densities for ceramics and as well for metals are above uh, 99%. And uh, also the, the properties of copper, such as electrical conductivity, uh, is very close to the electrical conductivity of a pure copper made via traditional ways. So typically we make comparable uh, parts as uh, traditional manufacturing uh, ways. Okay, thank you. Um, do you need a special machine or tool for printing the copper alumina parts? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, as I said, uh, that's an uh, R&D uh, development which we are doing uh, this year. Uh, the print we have shown, we have done with the Atmoflex 130 as shown on the last page of the presentation. Uh, although we are currently busy making a uh, machine which can do the multi-material printing uh, totally automatic. And this machine is planned for release on the form next in uh, November. So we are working on that uh, very hard now. Uh, so we can do it already with two individual machines, but the plan is to make it totally automatic uh, on the bigger Atmoflex 300 uh, machine. But uh, more information about multi-material printing will uh, will follow in the coming months. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Harry, but again, a question for uh, Atmatec. Is Atmatec working towards refractory metal slurries for DLP or was that for MIM? I think this is more the, the metal injection molding uh, question. Can you comment on that, Harry? Uh, yes, uh, what you saw in the presentation that is uh, related to MIM. Uh, the reason I was for a moment quiet, uh, I'm not 
totally aware of uh, everything in development is uh, uh, in progress uh, at Antmatec, but I can con conclude from your question, Lauren, that uh, this is not um, something you are uh, working on at this moment. So yes, it's uh, MIM. And OK, we have many customers uh, asking uh, questions to develop certain materials. I know uh, so with DLP, we're also looking towards uh, refractory uh, metals. And I know that Formatec is already offering uh, and uh, delivering uh, tungsten and molybdenum uh, parts with very high purity. And so that's also one of the, uh, the, the unique features uh, Formatec uh, can offer. OK, thank you both. Um, well, uh, as far as I can see it, those were the questions for now. Um, as I said, uh, we scheduled a Pichakacha style presentation to make it uh, short and for everyone easy to follow. Uh, as promised, after this presentation, we will share the recording with you. Um, so for now, I would like to uh, thank you all again for attending. Uh, say goodbye to you and uh, hope you have a very nice day. Yes, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.